name is Nicholas Belmonte. I run the visualization and data engineering teams at Uber. Uh, this is about a 50 people organization with about 30 folks focusing on visualization engineering and 20 folks uh, focusing on data engineering, building ETLs, data modeling for the core business entities uh, at Uber. So in this presentation, I'll walk through a little bit more around the applications, frameworks, and pillars, main themes that we kind of choose for doing visualization at Uber. Um, Visualization has expanded quite a bit because we partner with multiple other data producing teams. And so we end up doing visualization for a lot of different domains. Uh, because of that, we have a really large area of, uh, and surface of collaborations with other groups. And we've kind of learned a lot from the other domains to uh, build you know, domain specific tools for. Uh, a little bit more about the team in terms of like skill sets and background. Um, you know, we cover folks that are around information design, computer graphics, and web engineering groups. Other companies usually build teams around other pillars like design um, and data science. As part of front-end engineering, could be another kind of like um, you know a frame of reference to hire folks around visualization. Uh, another frame of reference could be adding the data word here, right? But that is a completely separate team that we that we run today on the data side. And some of the products that we build are more around visualizing business data in the beginning. So historically, we started that way, uh, just spatial data uh, and then self-driving car uh, information. So why visualization? I kind of hinted at this a couple times already today. But uh, we you know, do process billions of GPS points on a daily basis at Uber. Um, and uh, you know, we spend resources and cycles like processing and storing this information, and every time we're actually not extracting insights from this data, either through visualization or analysis, it's a big opportunity missed for a business. These are two pretty interesting examples on how visualization had a kind of a direct impact on, um, of, on some of our tools or, or pickup experience. On the left side, uh, this is SFO, and we have a writer on the blue dot who's uh, you know, calling a driver to get picked up and misses the driver so that the driver needs to do an extra loop to go and pick up the rider so that they go together on a trip. Um, before um, you know, coming up with these visualizations, we had actually absolutely no insight into the anatomy of a missed pickup. And thanks to these sort of like really fine-grained visualizations, we can better quantify what are the, kind of the main challenges with the pickup experience, and we can work towards enhancing that. Um, on the right side is a completely opposite uh, lens, right? In, in, on the left, we have a really fine-grained view of the, uh, of the trip. And then on the right side, we have an accumulation and aggregation of hundreds of thousands or millions of points to try to better understand what is the, you know, the areas for demand and supply and you know, uh, where do we have more trips and, and pickups and drop-offs and so on. Um, so we categorize the visualizations that we do across five pillars. Um, and these you know, may evolve through time, but we've discovered that these are the main areas that we are having as a visualization team a really big impact um, on. The first one is business insights, the most kind of direct and obvious way for visualization to have an impact through explanatory visualizations of data, showing you what your KPIs are, what your key progress indicators for the company are, um, and, and try to find causality across those metrics, right? So this doesn't go beyond the business insights that, that you know, except that we today may have a bit more exploration of those insights, and I'll show a little bit more around that area. Machine learning, uh, of course, visualization has helped We've seen this in the past, uh, troubleshoot and debug machine learning models so that we understand how they work and what's not working about them. And maybe we can work towards building a better model um, or have an ensemble of, ensembling of different models so that you know, it behaves better. Uh, Geospatial, we'll cover that in detail. Advanced programs has been mostly the advanced technology group, um, but I'll get into that into detail as well. And the storytelling has been around building or crafting visual narratives to tell um, you know, important stories that both resonate with our brand and with a point that we want to you know, help come across. So on the business insights uh, side, we you know, have a really large area of operators at Uber. Uh, not everybody 
are engineers. In fact, I would say a b really big chunk of folks are operations folks and people who are distributed across all these cities uh, looking at the you know, different dynamics of their own city and trying to make strategic decisions uh, you know, around marketing campaigns and driver incentives and other strategies. Um, and so we build tools for them too. We have probably say two personas within the business insights team. We have data consumers and data producers. Um, on the data producer side, we had a you know, ton of challenges around uh, fragmentation of data authoring tools, like what should we use, in-house stuff, spreadsheets, um, uh, Tableau, Looker, et cetera. Um, and we have a really, really interesting entry point for some of our tooling that lets people query for data and visualize it and kind of explore it uh, in the same tool. This tool today runs about 150,000 queries a week, manual queries that people type, questions that they have that they want to get answers from. Uh, we built a workflow where you can copy some of these URLs and paste them into sort of like a dashboarding authoring tool. You can select your own visualizations that you want to choose in order to explore this data. You can change the layouts for those visualizations. You can maybe pin them at different places in, the, in your dashboard layout. Um, in this case, now we'll choose a separate visualization for the same data set. This could be like you know, a tree map of you know, capacity usage per team or, or something like that. Um, and then you can pin this back into your dashboard. And then with just a few changes, you can add a title to your dashboard, publish your dashboard, and then share your dashboard with others or change the permissionings. So we kind of build a, an entire workflow from the data consumer point of view to the data producer. Um, and, and it's been working really well for us. So that's a, that's, that was a little bit more into detail for the business insights side of things. On the machine learning side of things, um, I'll, I'll go quickly because we're into maps here. But uh, we've identified three types of personas that work around machine learning, people who develop new models, people who take in the output of multiple models to the ensembling, and then engineers that deploy these models and kind of like track the performance of these models. So for the first two, we've been developing novel visualization techniques to enable data scientists uh, and that plug into data, you know, core data science workflows so that people can quickly iterate on their machine learning models. They understand where these models actually fail uh, or are not performing as well as they would like to. And they can come back to their own models and retrain them or change certain things about them, uh, tweak the params, et cetera, to, to, to get better performance on those. Um, on the geospatial side, we've had multiple use cases for, for geospatial visualization. Some of them are explanatory again, trying to show like how uh, you know, your business, your city is doing in a way that's not, not spe specifically super exploratory. Uh, we already know what are the questions that you have around your business, around supply and demand. But we also have exploratory visualizations of data that where you can just dump in your information and try to slice and dice the data and aggregate it in multiple ways in order to extract insights from that. Um, an example of it uh, is, is today we've open source Kepler. And you're able with that to show you know, different pickup and drop off information, turn on layers that aggregate this data. Uh, in this case, for example, we have frequency of pickups uh, encoded in color. Uh, we can encode that in 3D as well. So we have on the elevation side of things, we're encoding density of pickups the same way that we're encoding that in color. We could change the elevation to encode something else, for example, trip distance. And so now we have the taller uh, bars are the ones that encode where trips were the, the longest. And then we can have other layers, like arc layers and brushing techniques, where we can query for, like, given an area of pickups across Manhattan, uh, what was the distribution of drop-offs for those pickups? So we can quickly filter out specific areas within the map so that we can better understand where people go from a, from a specific location. Um, another use case for it could be from, instead of looking at aggregated data, it could be like looking at a specific trip, right? Uh, for example, this could be like, you know, a car driving around, making a trip. Um, and so we could pair that both with like rider and driver data and try to understand like, what were the patterns that happened? Did the person have to wait long? Uh, was this a cause of rider cancellation? How can we make the product better for riders? Uh, in this case, we can visualize uh, both how the driver pick up the rider and they go together on a trip. So that is a way to quickly reconstruct a trip um, for, for more insights and analysis. 
uh, we've been using the same technology that we've developed in-house, and I'll talk about the, the platforms that we've developed, and they're all open source, to uh, build visualization layers that are web-based to visualize perception, prediction, and motion planning data for uh, self-driving cars. So we do have the data there, and uh, we've partnered with multiple organizations. One of them is the Advanced Technology Group. So in this case, uh, when we first kind of collaborated with them, um, the stack that they were using to visualize this data was very different. It was uh, you know, hardware-specific, OS-specific. It was not web-based. Uh, there were a few challenges with the information design side of things uh, in terms of what to visualize and, and how to recognize what you're looking at. But also, there were some challenges around sharing, around collaborating. Um, that, you know, and, and also in terms of cost, right? You need a specific machine to run these things. So we decided to uh, use our knowledge, previous knowledge and know-how around like building web tools and apply those techniques over to these sort of like, these sort of like um, uh, tools. And so we've created a web-based stack for visualizing this data. This is not editing or interacting that much as much as it is like getting information from something that may have happened. Um, it is a pretty advanced visualization stack, but again, everything that I'm showing here has been built on top of Mapbox um, as, as a base map, and a lot of really custom layers are on top of that using uh, libraries that are mentioned later, but DECGL and, 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 and other platforms that we've developed. Um, and then this tool has been serving multiple use cases, so we're solely, solely plugging into the workflows of, uh, you know, core workflows around triaging or et cetera. And, uh, and kind of modernizing a little bit some of the tool set there. Uh, this is another set of examples. So this could be used to visualize like map features um, and other use cases. Uh, finally, we've created visual narratives and visualizations for public facing purposes, um, like visualizing a day in the life of Uber in terms of looking at trips and GPS traces for different cities. Um, these have been really uh, useful to build, you know, uh, collaborations with the policy team, with the communications team, with the marketing teams, um, and other ways where we're moving around the public-facing uh, uh, area is towards open sourcing a lot of the work that we do, talking about the process of building tools uh, with, with these platforms, and then uh, talking a little bit more about uh, the new products that we're releasing in terms of apps like Movement and Kepler, which I'll cover next. Uh, this I probably covered. OK, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the stack that we use in order to create all these things. You've seen a bunch of examples of internal tools. Uh, let's talk a little bit about external applications that we've developed um, at Uber then that today you can use, you can leverage, uh, either on the data side, on the visual exploration side, or um, just to use as frameworks and platforms to create your own applications. Uh, movement today, how many of you have heard of Movement? Okay, a few hands. Um, it is a free and public website using Uber's data to really help cities. The same way that you can think of customers as being riders and drivers, you can think of a customer as being a city itself. And how can you really help uh, uh, you know, bump some metrics on, on, uh, on the city side of things? So we really em try to empower cities to solve problems in the community and help share city successes with the world. We do this by a kind of a two-way strategy. On one end, we kind of like try to provide a set of data sets that can be used openly. And the first data set that we're providing is around travel times. Um, and you know, we're working on, on making more data sets available around speeds, for example. Um, but the other, the other way that we're trying to uh, do this is by telling stories based on this data. So for example, we can talk about the effects of DC metro rail service disruptions on traffic congestion and, and look at like what the city looks like in terms of travel times given this event. Um, and so this actually helps us provide insights to city authorities and kind of like try to figure out some sort of strategy on like how can we help address this as well. Uh, needless to say that this has been also like a pretty uh, solid uh, kind of initiative on the brand side. Uh, you know, usually folks are happy when we are, you know, opening up some of the data sets, and um, and so we're we're kind of like investing more on that as well. Uh, another completely different way that where we can we can build an app is 
forget about the data and think about the front end uh, and how will you be visualizing that data, whatever that data is. So build an application that's fully agnostic of the data that's underlying and try to make it as flexible as possible so that people can plug that into any data set. So you could imagine Kepler being in, I don't know, a data.gov site, um, you know, browsing all geospatial information from the government. Or it could be plugged into any other type of data source, real time or historical. So um, this product has been years in the making. Uh, we've had multiple use cases internally at Uber, both for real time visualization of you know, cars and supply and demand positioning to historical data visualization of understanding, you know, areas of pickups and drop-offs or, you know, understanding more specifically what happened with a, a given trip. Um, and so we kind of like factored in all these use cases and realized that we could, you know, uh, work towards opening up this application to the rest of the world and see what people would build with these things. So some of the, some of the key things of this application are like it's free. It's all in one, both cartography and geospatial analysis. So you have all of the power of Mapbox to tweak all of the cartography features that you'd like to tweak. And at the same time, you have the power of DECGL and other platforms that I'll cover later, where you can use all of these powerful layers to visualize large amounts of data. Um, it's easy to use to the extent of like, if you're familiar with things like ArcGIS or other tools like that, this is simpler. Um, and it is data agnostic, so you can just drop a GeoJSON, CSV file, et cetera, and then you can start like, visualizing that in multiple ways. Um, it is uh, high performing in the sense that it's using the GPU, it's using WebGL the same way that Mapbox GL uses WebGL. Um, or maybe in a tiny different way, but I'll go into detail on that later. And then you, know, you can really generate uh, very compelling maps that we've used both internally to get insights from data, but also that we've used externally as a means of like, storytelling and, and create, creating visual narratives. Um, an example of Kepler, uh, again, you can look at the different layers together. In this case, we have morning and evening pickups and drop-offs. Uh, I think that one of, really, of the really like, differentiating factors and cool features that Kepler has is this like, dual map mode. So you can open up two maps and have side-by-side -side views. Uh, there is a clear like, visualization challenge with mapping and layers is that you overlay the layers. So occlusion is a big issue for us. But if you had two maps side by side, you could compare like day and night kind of patterns around pickup and drop-offs. Um, so yellow dots here are drop-offs, and blue dots are pickups. Uh, if you see some of the areas around Brooklyn, you'll see that uh, in the morning commute, you'll see more blue dots than, than yellow dots. Uh, another way to have a look at it is to uh, create um, you know, hex bin maps. And then you can use the elevation of the hex bin maps and the occlusion factor as a means to say, OK, there are more pickups here than drop-offs, or there are more drop-offs in this area than pickups. And so it makes it easier to compare the kind of the diff between pickups and drop-offs. In this case, you have, uh, you know, on the left side, probably, uh, uh, the white hexagons are, are pickups. And so you get to see more pickups uh, in the areas of Brooklyn, for example. And the, in the evening, you get to see more drop-offs in the area of Brooklyn. So we covered uh, some of the applications that we've been releasing. And with the first release of Kepler, we already have a ton of ideas and feedback from both beta users and, and users that have been using it for the past two days um, on what we could be doing better and factor that uh, the fact that we already have plenty of ideas previously. So we'll continue uh, innovating in that space. Uh, but I also want to take some time to talk about the platforms that we're using to create these applications. And they're namely four, uh, DECGL, LumaGL, ReactMapGL, and ReactViz. I'll cover mostly the mapping-related ones. So let's start with DECGL. Um, DECGL was built to create large-scale WebGL-powered data visualizations. Um, there are a few factors within, within DECGL that I think are pretty interesting. Uh, first of all, we talked about using WebGL for visualization. That's exactly what we do. Uh, and it's highly performant. In this case, for example, we're visualizing about a million points um, or, ge or geometries within the browser. Uh, the other one is its strategy. So we have 
we have a, an interesting paradigm that we use that's called instancing and layering. So on the instancing side, um, I don't know if you've ever used D3 before, but there's a way of translating data into visual marks and channels, right? So you could say you have an array of you know, numbers, and then you can change those, and you can map them as heights of bars, right? Uh, and what that happened there is that you, create, you, know, you grab the rectangle, and you clone the rectangle multiple times, one per each element in your array, and then you change the height of that rectangle, right, for it to be a bar chart. So you instanced many times the same geometry. You can think of it the same way with scatter plots, right? You have a circle per data point, right? And then you tweak certain attributes of that geometry, like colors or radius or even the shape, uh, for it to encode some change in that data, in that information. So in this case, for these four maps, for example, the top left one you know, has a whole bunch of circles that have been instanced. Um, the top right one has a whole bunch of hexagons, bottom left, a bunch of squares, bottom right, a bunch of arcs. And uh, coincidentally, on the GPU, uh, you can do this very fast in a very cheap way. You can clone geometries in a very cheap way and then tweak them in a cheap way. And so we use that, and when I say cheap, is in a very efficient and fast way. So we use that technology uh, as a paradigm as well. So it's both an interesting InfoVis concept and an interesting computer graphics concept that we can leverage. And then secondly, we have this layering paradigm, which we're all familiar with if we ever done maps, so we can layer information of data one on top of the other. That's why it's called DEC. Um, some layers do other stuff, not only rendering. They can aggregate. They can filter data. They can perform certain operations. Uh, layers can enable interactions um, and, and you know, other things that are go beyond just rendering information. We've used DECGL not only for mapping environments. Uh, the mapping is an option. We used it, for example, for machine learning. In this case, we're visualizing an embedding created with a TSNE algorithm. Every point here is a driver. I think we're trying to find a cohort of drivers that are fraudulent. Uh, I know where it is but I won't tell you. And another thing that we're really proud of is um, a technique that we use around the GPU in order to get really high precision, precision rendering for dynamic range data. So basically, you have you know, really precision at the centimeter level from the world view up until as close as the intersection of a street without losing a lot of precision. So this is really hard to do on the shaders. Uh, in the GPU because we only deal with 32-bit floats. And if you know a little bit about precision, you'll see that we don't have enough precision there. So what we did is we emulated a 64-bit float as two 32-bit floats. And we had to re-emulate all the operations, not only the linear but the non-linear ones, for it to work with 64-bit floats. And the effect is actually pretty trippy, so I'll, I'll just show this video. Um, on the left side, we have a 32-bit 30 30 Mandelbrot, and on the 64-bit, you get to see what extra added level of detail and zooming you get from, from that. I can just play this in loop forever. Um, so we've seen a lot of really interesting examples, uh, both coming from the team but outside the team in terms of techniques and custom layers. So you can use layers, off-the-shelf layers, to visualize things as arcs and points and hexagons um, and squares. But you can also, uh, you know, if you want to dive deeper into the framework, create your own layers uh, and, and visualize them in very unique ways. Uh, we used a bunch of layers here to visualize elevation and uh, vector fields, as in air, right? So we use two different techniques to visualize vector fields, one with arrows and another one with points and particles moving around. The idea behind it is that we have data for wind, direction, and speed, and temperature across multiple weather stations. Unfortunately, these weather stations are not uniformly distributed across the US. So we cannot just build a uniform you know, grid of, of arrows uh, to follow the wind. So we created a layer that first does uh, kind of a smart computation uh, where it kind of interpolates wind speed, direction, and uh, temperature. You can use colors for that, R, G, and B, let's say, 0 to 1. And then you can render that into a texture. And then you can use the GPU interpolation of triangles 
to get intermediate values across the stations. So this gives you basically an image where you can sample any pixel, and then you'll get the wind direction, uh, speed, and, and temperature. Based on that, we created a wind animation of the last 72 hours uh, within the US. So a few interesting facts. Um, the top right corner is Mount Washington. So that's one of the places with the windiest, uh, windiest uh, wind <laughs> <laughs> that you can probably have. And I would probably not recommend you to go there. Um, and the following technique also uses particles. So another approach that you can use with this is you can just have a million particles and then drop them randomly uh, in the US and then see where they fall. And so you see a bunch of vortices and a bunch of interesting patterns form. Again, this is not accurate data. We just interpolated all this data on the GPU, which is an interesting data aggregation technique. Um, but then we get to visualize how, for example, the particles change as you change the hours of the day, and, and you visualize a different type of vector field. Um, so in order to build this, DECGL uses LumaGL. LumaGL, you can think of it as a lower level library. Um, it kind of uh, has a bunch of interesting points in terms of like, it is lightweight, it is built on ES6, uh, code base like modern JavaScript to some extent, and it is WebGL2 ready. So, uh, you know, as some libraries, for example, might want to dive deeper into areas like, um, you know, virtual reality and augmented reality, we're more interested in like leveraging the latest uh, features on WebGL to be able to do this type of visualizations. Uh, what this library can help you with is exploring different map projections. So this is a um, a fun, interesting visualization that shows you the actual data uh, area distortion that happens within the Mercator projection. You get to see that with circles and the shape of Greenland. Um, we created a, a way of creating map projections with LumaGL that does not have any area or angle distortion. So these are conformal projections and equal area projections. Uh, there is an expense at the expense of actually like creating many cuts and many interrupts. You can imagine this as like cutting paper multiple times in multiple areas and unfolding that paper. So it, it, it kind of borrows a lot of similar techniques from, from origami. Um, yeah, and so to recap, we have this sort of like set of building blocks, right? We use the frameworks to produce applications and these applications are fairly flexible and freeform. Uh, we offer, you know, data sets are open that people can leverage and you know, they've done research with, or they can infer interesting things about their city uh, with. And then we've created applications that you can plug any data set into and get insights from that by slicing and dicing the information. So this is a picture of the team. I was not there that day. It was a very sunny day. Uh, but yeah, thank you. <laughs>